and it's a way of, for us to learn more about our heritage and, and uh, the people that uh, uh, the Edgeworth family. And this year is no exception. We have John Bedos and tomorrow we have Dr. Susan Manley. Uh, so I now ask John uh, to do his presentation, which is about 30 minutes, I think. And so, so, John. Well, thank you very much for that warm welcome. Um, I think what's not for me is actually be here and actually surround by people who actually know Mariah Edgeworth. Uh, my wife gave me some strict instructions before coming, you'd be pleased to know. She said, look, John, don't go over time and don't be boring. <laughs> so after I've spoken, you can give me a last out of ten. So that would be, be helpful. I can walk back to England that um, I've followed one of my instructions. Um, no, where are we going to start? Um, I've got a clock there, so I can keep an eye on that. Um, um. I'll just start with a little introduction what's on the table and we'll get onto the slides. You might like to afterwards see, particularly, um, we've got a, 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 a pair lockets on Mariah Edgeworth, which came from the Meadows family. And we've got the original portrait of her full sister, Anna Meadows, Anna uh, Maria um, uh, uh, Edgeworth, and the Edgeworth Meadows, who we're talking about today. That's an original portrait, which belonged to the Meadows family, it got sold, and I brought it back again, and a lock of her hair. And we've got a Mariah Edgeworth signature and a letter. Um, for those of you who will be seeing, Susan's not here. No, since the money's not here. Uh, panic, over. If I do make any mistakes and make, make bad pronouncements of words, you know, just fill me in afterwards quietly and just say, look, John, look at them. I'm not very good at facts, so I have to tend to write them down. But I have got three of Susan's books here, um, Selected Tales from Children. I do recommend the Harrington one, um, particularly because two reasons. One, I think the thing about my Edge is the letters. The letters are just so, so, so good. Um, and if you read the letters and you dip into Harrington, especially Susan Manley's edition, you know, it's, it, 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 it's, it's just not, it's just fantastic. We also had a bit of a, a, a scramble around trying to remember all the names and all these various edges in the picture. And uh, good job I did find out because Susan has very kindly put them in front of the book. So <laughs> Susan, Susan, Susan here. You need to get that bit right. And uh, there's no one Susan's here. And hopefully that uh, I won't upset her over the weekend and she'll sign them. What I've also got here is a copy of Double Disguise. I'll talk about it later. I do recommend getting in touch with Ryan Twomey, who did ask me if I could plug the book anyway. I do recommend maybe one year you might put this play on. I think Mariah wrote it when she was about 16. Uh, uh, we haven't got a film of it tonight, but we'll see if you can go on YouTube. Just put Double Disguise and watch the uh, University Students of New South Wales, Australia produce it. Um, I can't spot an Australian accent in the, in, in, in the YouTube film. There is an Irish accent, and I'd like somebody to be able to watch it sometime and tell me, is it an acting Irish accent or is it a proper one? I don't know. Uh, but the part paper original version has got a very good, well, I think, very good Irish accent. And that's a copy of the play, and I'm sure if you get in touch with him, he'll, he'll probably give you stage directions and not those like, you can come over and speak anyway. A fantastic chap. And remind me, I do have two or three people who I've met speak about Mariah Reggie with passion. Um, and enthusiasm, and who've actually, I know two people who've actually read the whole of the 15 volume complete works of Mariah Edgeworth from beginning to end, and, they, and they're still very passionate about it. Um, and I think it's unfortunate some of the novels are a bit difficult to get hold of, I think, and you find that, but um, letters are easier. If you get somebody to, to, who, who understands them and reads them with passion, it's uh, fantastic, absolutely fantastic. And I just come back. This is quite a relief for me to come here. I spent four days in the National Library in Ireland, and I went back for another day on Monday, got in there at 9.30 in the morning, got kicked out and court to court to nine. Um, the the edge of collection that has been in the Irish um, Library, absolutely fantastic. They made great reading. A couple of times I've walked tears to my eyes. I have got a copy of, I've never seen it before anywhere, of um, Mariah Edge had copied out a death scene of Richard Love Ledgeworth, which I hadn't seen written anywhere, and that was, I had to go out and have a Quick cigar and a drink I've really liked. It was cool, yeah, it was good. Um, Richard Love Edgeworth jumping off the end of his bed and kneeling down in front of Mariah saying basically, you know, look after your money, Doc, and you know, yes, support your family, but don't, don't spend your capital. Um, oh, well. And also, being there's a lot of stuff that's in the Bodmin Library, which half of it, including this play, uh, was donated to the Bodmin Library um, by, by the Beddoes family who inherited quite a lot of Edgeworth material. So that's the table. Right, now then. Two commandments. Don't keep too long, don't be boring. We'll make a start if I can press the right button and find the zapper. Um, I'm going to wrap it, wrap it on. I'll try and speak quite quickly and paint a bit of a picture. It's, it all goes all over the place, but hopefully, we get to the end and get a bit of an idea of where I'm coming from. 
I think particularly with Anna's writing, I think we can see Mariah's writing, and I think what I, the bit that I've like learned particularly is how I think radical <laughs> feminist Mariah was and how she disguised it the same way as Jane Austen. She disguised that in her characters. I'll quote from Helen uh, at, the, at the end of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the pathways, and I, I, I do believe that she was a master craftswoman of um, putting forward uh, feminist views in a very clever way at that time. Um, okay, here's the bottom. I'm watching the clock. Right, here we go. Uh, well, this is Anna, who's all sister. And if I can stop shaking, I'm nervous. Breathe. <laughs> I'll be okay. Right, I'll press the button. Yeah, the, there's, there's the three sisters. Um, Morale was the other one. Next along, Anna. Anna, Anna Maria, I call her in England, Mariah, I call her over the Irish Channel, um, took her name from, from the mother. Um, and mother, I thought she died about seven, year, seven days after uh, Anna was born. Um, yeah, I think Amanda Foreman writes, in the words of Amanda Foreman, who notes that women have been treated abominably since the time memorial and that they have been written out of history, it is vital that we have a proper understanding of the past to ensure that the next revolution is the age of equality. And I think, you know, morale was the start of that. And I think it's, I look at history, it's men writing about men for men. And I think particularly the last couple of decades, we, you know, we, we have got a, a, a feminist perspective. And I think uh, morale was at the, at, the, at the forefront of that. How did I get here? How, how did you have the misfortune of ending up with me talking to you? Um, I started the TLB Society, and you can go and look on there's a website there, Thomas Double Bellio, sorry, that was Anna's uh, song. Very uh, famous romantic poet, people like Shelley Keats Bauer, and love his poems, I don't, I can't understand them. But people get very excited, we had about 100 members, and we put on various plays, and the reason I did it was his name was Lovell, and I was named after Lovell. The mum and dad thought we were related to Bellows, Thomas Double Bellows, I had no idea, so I then got involved in family history, and my middle name's Lovell. I then discovered Lovell, original Edgeworth, which then led to his <coughs> mum, Jane Lovell, so presumably that's where my Lovell has come from. Although the parents weren't actually convinced at the time, but probably <coughs> actually extended. And then spent, got a bit bored of playing with Thomas Lovell Bellows, so you love Jane <coughs> Barry, you'll love Bellows, people get, uh, Thomas Lovell Bellows, people get so fanatic about him, I can't quite do that. Dr Bellows, far more interesting, probably a bit Asperger's, a bit autistic, uh, of absolute interest, but the process of doing that, I come across Anna, who I think, like Briar, I think um, Bumpy Davy said that given the right circumstances, she had the talent to rival the great Mariah herself, and she probably did. I still haven't convinced you of that in 32 minutes. Right, the first thing that really got me across the Mariah, about 32 years ago, I started doing this family history, and well, the first place I think it was Edgewood Town, it was a few years ago, I've come back since uh, today. You've got a new ring road, and there's some more traffic lights, I see. Um, I put my tent up at St John's, uh, uh, the rectory, on the lawn. And have a, a lunch with the vicar, I think. But what got me really interested, I couldn't sometimes all those poems, and Dr. Bellows is a bit complicated, but Mariah's um, letters, I just got hooked. Is that me? Is that my wife? No, it's me. Um, this was the first bit that I read. Um, I can, there are quotes, and for those people who are interested, I think Angela's got a, a PDF in it, and there are a few to go around with the, uh, the handouts. Uh, I haven't written down where this particular letter comes from, but this is what got me really interested. After the cat's departure, Agnes took to heart a kitten, who was very fond of her. The kitten, the first night she slept in her room, on waking in the morning, looked up from the hearth at Agnes, who was lying awake, but with her eyes half shut, and marked all Puss's motions. After looking some instants, Puss jumped up onto the bed, crept softly forward and put her paw with its glove on, upon one of Mrs. Bailey's eyelids, and pushed it gently up. Miss Bailey looked at her fixedly, and Puss, as if satisfied that her eyes were there and safe, went back to her station on the hearth, and never troubled herself more about the matter. I think Mariah just, in the letter that she's writing personally to her brothers and sisters and her friends, and I think her, her personality and her character uh, come across, and she just comes across as a, a lovely person who I would like to have met. I can't remember if I stopped shaking to anything. Which one I know. Okay, Richard Love Ledgeworth. Um, a reason I put this one in here is 
I come from Derby, or our age went to school in Derby, I think I've been misbehaving and jumping on top of grasses and ripping up settees and throwing mm -hmm. teas in people's faces. She was a bit upset because her mum had died. Um, she went to Derby, a school near near where I live. Her sister Emily followed her. Um, we're quite close to Erasmus Darwin, uh, Edward, Edward's big friend. Erasmus Darwin died um, the day that he was writing a letter, half of a letter to Richard Lovell Edgeworth. We've got in our local hospital a, a heating system, which was uh, Richard Lovell Edgeworth had a thing with the pie, the two, I keep saying snide, it's snade, isn't it? The two snade wives, Edgeworth wife two and three, were lived in a house, Berkeley Lodge, about 10 miles from where I live, it's our garden centre. Um, and Mariah Edgeworth and I actually come from Temple Belper, and Mariah Edgeworth visited Belper. We've got some uh, stops, uh, some Mariah Edgeworth letters in our local history library when she visited Belper. Um, but I think this one, it's Mr. Ledger's. Your mother desires me to thank you very kindly for the embroidered work by you sent her, which gave her more pleasure than anything of that kind ever did. She thinks it is remarkably well done, and she's very glad you've acquired a taste for that kind of work as it will be a source of constant, innocent, feminine amusement. And I think this constant feminist amusement, this uh, picking out from Jane Austen, was, I think, what Mariah was, was, was trying to put, put across. So hang on, uh, men, you don't have to necessarily rule the world. Um, I think I've gone the wrong way, haven't I? So I'm going to like that. Stowe House is getting quite near to us in Litchfield. They, uh, Anna and Mariah were living here with Thomas Day. Try and get a speaker on Thomas Day. He had a speaker on Thomas Day. Richard Lovell's a big friend. You, you must. Very enigmatic, fascinating, fascinating. Have anybody seen the How to Make the Perfect Wife book by uh, Wendy Moore? If you can't, Wendy Moore can come over and speak to you. Fantastic. I recommend that to everybody. Uh, obviously, he didn't make the perfect wife. Um, that, that was um, uh, Richard Lovell who lived there, along with um, Thomas Day and Mariah and Anna. Uh, for his second marriage. As you stand now, of course, we know. The portrait, the reason I've got this here is we've got Anna looking away, which is typical of Anna. We've got Emily here, and we've got Mariah there, with all sorts of various characters all dotted around here. And um, moving on, we've got we've gone to the play. Uh, you can see it was edited by, published by the web address on YouTube. I recommend you just go onto YouTube and have a look at it. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Um, we, the interesting thing about it is that all these people, they did the play in 1787, and then they redid it in 1881. But by which time, um, Emily was married to Dr. King, who Dr. Bellows, her husband, had employed it in Bristol, and I, of course, was Bellows. And if you go in the Oxford, in the Bodley Library, you can see the original plays written out and, the, and the, 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 who, who acted what when for the two performances. Um, yeah, it's uh, well worth a bit, of, a bit of time on that one. Here we've got a, just a shot, we were going to have a quick bit of a play but it wouldn't go onto the screen. We've got, this, this, was, this was Anna, um, this was Emily, this was Mariah Reggie who was playing the part of the um, maid, um, and this was Richard of Ledger. When you see the play, or read the play, Golly, what fun they must have had at Stone House. Um, they performed this twice, and once for the long film, and they rewrote it a bit to fit into somebody else. Um, I think that the latter science at the stages are a, a very happy household. So, what's the one about the play in the. There's many Jane Austen, there's so many parallels with what Jane Austen was doing here. Um, Richard of Ledger, in his wisdom, thought they all. Uh, uh, ought to get married, we ought to find some men for all these girls. We went to, went to Clifton and one of these houses we lived in number three, not sure which number three is. Um, and they uh, this was this was a house as well, Gloucester. I've just worked out from having been to Dublin it was number seven, but this is the, the house there. Very nice pub opposite the work opposite there. Um, lots of extra buildings in, in, in Bristol at Clifton. Um, while she was there, we, we, we meet Dr. Thomas Bellows, Mr. Late Enlightenment Incarnate. Of course, the famous historian said, What a man! I certainly probably one of the first uh, male feminists having to kick, us, kick around. Bellows has ideas, quarantine for imported dogs, washing machines for women. Okay, you know, not 
quite there yet, but we have an idea. National death certificates, National Centre for Collection of Prevention Medicine information, specifically the use of oxygen to preserve organs. Um, all sorts of <coughs> ideas, some of which are just happening. The, the oxygen one has just been happening about five years ago in America, uh, with our <coughs> that were transporting all, uh, organs in ambulances with, um, uh, with oxygen as opposed to um, you discovered laughing gas max oxide, great stories of, um, uh, of, of goings on at the Institute of reading the gases. Um, Robert Sully was there, I'm not sure if he wrote um, Gold Lots and Free Bears, Coat Laureates. Coldridge, certainly lots of his work was done under the nitrous oxide. And I would have been, and I would have been beating these people a lot more than Wordsworth. Beddoes uh, became for paper with biology, the first teaching hospital, the first research hospital, the first research preventative medicine. Very philanthropic, and sort of helping people. I mean, Richard and Lady from the Lunar Society, what work they did, bloody hell, how they had time for it all. I, I, I just take my hat off to them. I keep pressing the wrong button. Slow down. There we go. Right, Anna falls for Beddoes, Beddoes falls for Anna. Um, in the conversations which are, this is better speaking, being together, occasionally brought on, I used to begin with some of those uninteresting topics which are so well paraphrased to relieve the distress of persons who must say something to each other and know not what to say. She, that's Anna, with admirable dexterity, turned the conversation to something interesting and introduced remarks very far beyond the measure of her age and almost of her sex, as the condition of the sex is at present. She has never been so romantic as to imagine that only one woman in the world would suit a particular man, and vice versa. I think we're beginning to get into Jane Austen. Dr. Bellows, if, um, if it is not a law, to which all married men are doomed, that in time they, will, they shall grow tired of a woman of whom they must see a great deal, I may hope to escape. The person so much interested in not becoming indifferent to me has often expressed her apprehension on this head, and from her knowledge of the danger as well as her just sense and the variety of her talents, one may hope that she will avoid it if it can be avoided. And they're only just managed by the skin of her teeth to avoid it, really. Along comes Humphrey Davy, fresh from Cornwall, Davy Lamp, um, second person to be, what I see, knight or whatever, a long movie. Uh, totally besotted by Anna. Anna was totally besotted by Davy. Humphrey Davy, Mrs. Bellows is the reverse of Dr. Bellows. Extremely cheerful, gay, and witty. She is one of the most pleasing women I've ever met with. With a cultivated understanding and an excellent heart, she combines an uncommon simplicity of manners. Uh, we, are already, we are already great friends. That was on day one, writing back to his mom. Day two, I think. She possesses a fancy, almost poetical, in the highest sense of the word. Great warmth and affection, disinterestedness of feeling, and under favourable circumstances, she would have been even a talent, uh, even a talent of uh, uh, arrival of Mariah. Um, Honest uh, Humphrey Davy, absolutely besotted, the best and most amicable woman in the world. Although he went on to marry a blue stocking um, Lady Davy, when he was dying over in Europe, he was still referring to Anna Bellows' eyes and her hair and her voice. Laughing gas, we've got the institution where the beating in the gases, which Humphrey Davy and Bellows between them, James Watt built the machinery. Um, you can go, you used to be able to go to the Science Museum in, in London and see the creation of the front route where Anna lived and Mariah Rachel had visited, but it's, they're having a reorganisation moment and the, the rooms got lost. I think, they, I think they're going to reappear. Um, Dave to Anna, she did not say she loved, yet from her glowing cheek and from her humid eye and from her trembling hand and from her throbbing heart, I learnt the rapturous truth. Steady on, Davy, be careful. Anna to Davy, with thee forever could I stay, thy presence makes all nature glad. With thee past each successive day, not ever feel one moment sad. Davy wrote various poems to Anna, Anna wrote various poems to Davy, which are in the Institute in London. Anna to Davy, oh, every moment seems an age, now that I'm far my love from thee. 
that thoughts of meeting me assuaged and grief, which else would fatal be. Oh, um, I could be right to hear of Mariah's uh, very first novel when she was in Derby, of um, quite gothic, um, I think taking the skin off um, somebody's face and using it as a disguise. Um, Different sort of sensibility in those days, isn't it? Similarities, it's, it's, it's commented time and time again that Anna and, and Morale were very, very similar in looks, very similar. Uh, I think they were both actually quite proud that they looked like each other. Was, uh, um. Okay, Davy, Grant Royal, I think Tanon Bellows is a bit risky to Democrats, he's been followed as Wordsworth and Shelley are by the uh, Wordsworth and um, Coldridge are by the police, uh, the secret police. Uh, he thinks he's going to move off into the pastures new. Anna then gets hold of Mr. Davis Giddy, which is a chapter on its own. Um, Giddy's house is all there in, in Cornwall, where, where Anna would have visited. Anna goes to Giddy, leave your study and your bees and come to our rocks and trees. This is by way of a rhyme you seize. Doctor is very well, and between writing and curing and killing, very busy. <laughs> Typical Mariah Edgeworth type, you know, humour there. Um, uh, very, very clever, I think. One thing I've always thought, and believe, always shall think, that I would infinitely rather be mistress to the man I love than wife. Hmm. But since this is contrary to all custom and cannot be, I must be content with being a wife in the usual way. And she did, I think. So, some people disagree, but anyway. Anna, when I fearfully sought in your eyes what I trembled, lest least you should see finding mine, 
the security I felt in this dangerous situation, the pride of having warmed a heart, glowing with virtue, of having interested and understanding such as yours, raised me, in my own opinion, far too probably I sank in yours. That type of, sort of writing appears time and time again with, 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 with Mariah, as well as Anna. I think, I think Anna might, I don't know who's copying who here. Uh, Anna, now I'm angry with you. Why did you do this? Surely you need not consider so very mathematically, problematically, and any other attically that you can muster. Well, she did have a temper, Anna, and it was probably best to keep on the right side of it. <laughs> Gracious heavens, why has thou made it so hard not to be criminal? Had we not been dignified by the name of man, we should have been innocent. Had we been two birds, two butterflies, should we not have fairly sported without the thought of harm? Do not avoid me. It will be my own fault if our being together is a source of concern to you. But if you avoid me, I feel your return when you come unexpectedly into the room. So strongly that I shall certainly betray myself if we always come together as brother and sister. A cultivated mind without the aid of conversation is like a meadow neglected by the side. Nothing new springs up. And how fresh and green is the meadow, cropped perpetually by the mower. It springs up fresh and clear when pruned by the sickle of conversation. These type of things just keep cropping up in the letters time and time again. I and mean, I've obviously been a bit biased about the other ones, but um, I think Ryle was actually a bit better. Uh, they were living in Dowry Square, which you may see in Bristol. They were this building here, the bit to the side, and there's a, another bit over there. Um, and that's like a corner, and it shoots around the back. Um, that's the house where they live, where I there's a plaque here, uh, which I think is on the next one in Diary Square. You can go to, um, no, sorry, that's the that's in Diary Square, that's the dispensary. There's a plaque here in Mariah's name on. If you go to the Rodney Hotel here, you can have a drink in Mariah's was leaving this property here. And at the bottom of this garden, of this property, we come to where Emily uh, lived with Dr. King, and that's their house there, which Mariah visited. There's got a few letters from, from there. 26 the mile. Mariah Rachel, we know, I think a lot about her. Thomas of the you've got to talk about Thomas of the They did not get on. Mariah and Thomas of the I don't quite see why. I don't get on with Thomas of the at all. Um, uh, he snubbed Mariah a couple of times. Um, that, yeah, he was not a favourite. The other, there was another son called Henry, could do no wrong. All the letters from Mariah are saying, I did Henry, and Henry was actually the blue boy. And she did love the girls. One of the girls, Mary, one of his sister Mary, uh, helped him around do one of the children's books. Uh, she was here. Robert Subby was kicking about down there doing his uh, Goldilocks and Green Bears. Sammy Taylor Cosh, we've met. Um, on hearing of death of Dr. Bellows, hope has been taken out of my life by more than any other form of event. Um, George Lampton is an interesting person, writes to Sneed. Um, over Edgeworth Town, became Lord Durham. Um, fascinating in themselves. Um, he's uh, basically Bellows was thinking, well, we've got the French Revolution kicking off, we've got these aristocrats, we need their money. I mean, Bellows was, the, the institute was financed by <coughs> a couple of million pounds by various people, Duchess of Devonshire, uh, various people from the Lunar Society were, were, were sponsoning him. But he, this, this chap there, his dad died in Italy, Bellows was, was nursing him. And um, Douglas was educating them with Anna, uh, and Mara was there at, at, at the time that these children were there, and Humphrey Davy. What was it? Was it was a group of children. Um, Humphrey Davy, you know, you, people giving you lessons, and these are the lads. And Douglas has been paid to do it. Um, but the idea being was he thought at least he could educate people in a sort of radical, um, uh, democratic, if you could call democratic in those days, I mean, you, you know, it's a really bad thing to be. Uh, and, you know, if, if the revolution did come across the channel, at least they'd have some sort of. Um, uh, something to fall back on, uh, but likewise, they, they all have a lot of seats in the House of Lords and things, they could affect change, um, which is, I think, what you know, Edgeworth and the Bishop of Edgeworth, particularly the Lunar Society, were after. Um, William Henry Lampton. Bellows and Lampton visited Watts oh, and Bolton. Uh, this inspired William Lampton to see them both, very dangerous saying this, as champions of practical science and gave him a degree of respect which he had never felt for monarch or minister. This bit, the Mitchell of Edgeworth, obviously, uh, with this sort of Catholic and Protestant bit going on over here, 
you know, saying that over, you know, it, 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 we're, we're into a bit dangerous territory. Uh, Peter Mark Rogers was also employed uh, in, in the Institute, and Anna and Moran met, met him. William Wurzel was popping in for tea, Georgina, Duchess of Dempsey was getting loads of money out. But all Tannin Benno's had stopped being a Democrat and keep his fiscal views well in. Um, Lunar Society was subscribers. Richard Ledger obviously was there, and he gave Bellows a big ball of him. I think he goes, Dr. Bellows, the object of Anna's vows, is a little fat Democrat of considerable abilities. Again. But if he blows the trumpet of sedition, the aristocracy will rather go to hell with Satan than with a democratic devil. I don't know if anybody listened to that, much to James Watt sometimes. James Watt, he's there. Anna to James Watt. Um, though I have not had the pleasure of being known to this. The what yet. Bellows has persuaded me to write a few lines to explain or certify my innocence and total ignorance about the plate in question. I never had the honour of even seeing Mr. Pearson, but I hope this may, mistake will give you no trouble or uneasiness as it will most probably see. That slide's actually sneaked in from the Lewis Society talk again, but it gives an idea of the sort of language that they were using um, and, and the people they were in contact with. James Watt Jr. James Watt Sr. Right wing. James Watt Jr. Democrats. How they, how they lived in their house, who really knows. Um, we. Anna to James Watt. She flirted with James Watt uh, Jr. When the Creator caused the heavens and the earth to be made, he liked to appear birds, beasts, and fish to come to life. He always took the trouble to look and see that they were good. Can you follow a better example? You said, let there be chemical lectures. I told Mr. Bellows. And there were chemical lectures. You must now come and see that they are good. I am aware that you have a world of business, but surely not more than was to be done in the days of chaos. All your works in mathematical order will go on like clockwork and need not require winding up the few days of your absence. And as James Watt Jr., perhaps to see me on, Suppose you set out on Sunday, you could not then exclaim that you have lost the day. The subject of next Monday evening lecture is heat, uh, which subject Dr. B thinks more worthy of your presence than any others. The stimulus of a large audience is great, but I cannot help thinking that of a select one is greater. The first the doctor has in abundance, the other is in your power to grant, which you are as sensible of as I can make you. Therefore, I need say no more, yet I believe I must. I have been accused of writing obscurely, perhaps, and now I deserve that invitation. Um, how did you have time to write all this? I don't know. Uh, Matthew Bolton was uh, funding it and picking it about. Um, we were too far away. William Withering, <coughs> members of the Lunar Society, Thomas Fellows reports William Withering, the lack of interest in chemistry in Oxford. Um, the stock of curiosity seems nearly exhausted. He did like writing that, I suppose, didn't they? Now, James and Amelia Kerr, I think, are important because Anna actually became friends with the media, and then Mariah Rachel became very firm friends with the media. Um, there was um, yeah, a, a, a lot of letters going to and fro there. Um, James Kerr is, um, yeah, uh, I think he's right that um, Mrs. Bellows uh, should do personal homage. Uh, I do not think horror the idea will, will keep her back. Uh, she will start next week, I hope. Um, yeah, it's a basic led to the friendship with, uh, with Mariah. Um, yeah. Amelia writes, I heard the sorrow of the death of Mrs. Bevers. <coughs> she will always be associated in my mind with very pleasing recollection from the time when I first saw her in the year 1793 at Clifton and preferred her to all her sisters. She was huge. Pleasing from her intellectual vivacity, the quickness of observation peculiar to the edge of family, and an originality of thought inducing an exhaustible variety of amusement in conversation, uh, united with feminine tenderness and the delicacy of feeling. How great will be the loss for her young family. Um, I suppose nice to to for a tribute for me. Yeah. Um, let's move on. That's just seating on stage. Thomas Day, I say, he gets his point. Thomas Day. If you if you read in Melinda, Thomas Day is is is, is our instability. Do you pronounce it? He's, that's uh, that's the character Thomas Day. Does anybody know about Thomas Day? Ooh, I can put him on your agenda. I mean, he was 
Richard Lovell Edge was a big, big friend. I mean, you know, he put his son from us there after all. Um, fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Joshua Wedgwood was also in the mix. Um, oh, now, Joshua's daughter, Sarah Elizabeth Wedgwood, was treated by Bedos for cur uh, cur curvature of the spine and lived until she was 87. Bedos suggested that swinging the patient by the legs often helped to straighten the spine. But in the case of Elizabeth, he felt bound to point out two objections. She was too tall and she was a girl in her teens. To overcome the former would take great strength, to overcome the latter, some consideration in the matter of delicacy. Now, neither would be insurmountable. Eternal optimism, fellows. Thomas Wedgwood was knocking about, um, gave a large sum. Joseph Priest was always said there. Erasmus Darwin, as you obviously know, uh, big friends of Edgewood, big friends of Bellows as well. Um, he, writes, I, he writes to Bellows and Anna, I congratulate you on the being on the road to happiness. And I hope you will contribute to repeople the world which our politicians are endeavouring to desolate. Quite true, isn't it? Really? Um, now I'm going to give my voice rest for two minutes. Uh, we're coming to uh, a play written by David Chandler, forecast on BBC. I lost it, it was on a cassette, I went onto a CD, and then the bit I wanted got lost. So I went down to our local church, got, there, got my vicar to ring the bell, and my vicar to pay a card, and my vicar's wife to pay a card. And basically, we, what we've got is James Watt burying his daughter Jessie. Consumption was killing everybody, and lots of the Edgewood family, I think he's four or five, who died of consumption. And you know, better his gas work, you know, working with gas was, was sort of hopefully a cure, it didn't work out that way. And here we've got Anna in the churchyard trying to persuade Bellows off to perhaps last third or to stick, and have a bit of sympathy for James Watt. Um, and it's uh, actors by our local, uh, our local church. Um, just one thing was on. For as much as it has been pleased Almighty God for his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of this in child here departed, we therefore commit her body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'll excuse me, I have many more poor souls to attend to this morning. I'm so sorry, Mr. Watt. Thank you, Dr. Meadows. Thank you for all you did for poor Jessie. It wasn't enough, was it? The apparatus is woefully inadequate. Our deepest sympathy, Mr. Watt. If there's anything... Thank you, Mrs. Bedow. Anything at all. Thank you. When the factitious air is at any pressure, it leaks out from between the mouthpiece and the oil silk bag. The patient never gets the full dose. Dr. Bedow is not now. Hush, Mrs. Bedow. You hush. We take every possible precaution. Mr. Bedow's baby impregnates each bag with charcoal dust, and the little scenes are anointed with Japano's gold size. It is an arduous process, and in the light of present circumstances, completely unsatisfactory. Will not you say so, Mr. Watt? I'm sorry. I yes, in my paper on consumption, fever, and other diseases with which Dr. Erasmus Darwin wholeheartedly concurs, and in the late collection of letters from different correspondents on the subject of pneumatic medicine, it is abundantly proved that the application of elastic fluids to the cure of diseases is both practicable and promising. Dr. Bellows, please have some sort of consideration. You're right, Anna. Devil break these valves. I can't even hear myself think. Mr. Watt, you must excuse my husband. He, he, oh, don't, don't blame me, Mrs. Bellows. Mr. Watt knows as well as you or I that the main fault lies with the wooden mouthpiece. On how many occasions have I been confounded by the spigot becoming jammed? Dr. Meadows. How often, Anna, have I come to you with a jammed spigot? This is hardly the time. Hardly the time? Children are dying, Mrs. Meadows. It is high time. Dr. Meadows, please. I'm sorry. I'm a blunt man. I speak my mind, and I am disliked for it. Not by present company, I assure you. The Royal Society. Oh, please don't allow him, Mr. Watts, to let loose upon the Royal Society. Mrs. Meadows, you forget your place. The Royal you Society. You're forgetting this one. The Royal Society, sir, which should be renamed the Reptile Society, have planted themselves upon the high road of improvement in order to kiss me back. You like the French too much. Tough hunting, fencing, whose cold blood runs hot at the mention of Dr. Meadows and his pneumatic institute. 
It is true. They do not support your theory. Not well, even by a single penny. Then you must go to the public for subscription. Aye, it is the same. The Hippocratic Oath and service of the mercantile principle. But are we dismayed? Mr. Watts, we have found a dwelling house in Otwells capable of receiving 12 patients. Indeed, it appears to me that it may be made fully to answer the purpose, since in many cases the airs may be administered without keeping the patient constantly in the house. Yes, of course. And I have engaged the most brilliant chemist, a young Cornishman, named of Davy, to implement a program of research into the procurement, purification, and administration of elastic fluids. And there is another young man, very clever. What's his name? Frank Sandy. What is it, Anna? Roger. That's it, Roger. His father had some connection with the revolution, I believe. A fresh out of Edinburgh University. Very clever upon the matter of human and animal physiology. Now, if Mr. Bolton and yourself were to redesign the breathing apparatus... Oh, can't you stop, if only for a moment? Stop, Mrs. Bellows? Does the small pop stop? Does the tuberculosis stop? Ask little Jessie, lying at our feet in her cold bed. <coughs> Listen to those confounded bells, they never stop. Just say you'll do it, Mr. Watt. Build me a device that will imbue the young with the root health they so richly deserve. And by God's good grace, we will transform our sick and drooping country into paradise more fair than the one dreamed of by France. Dr. Beddows, say you'll do it. When our patrons see that Bolton and Walter Heathfield are involved, the success of the Institute will be assured. Oh, for Jesse, you understand. For the sake of all children like her. You see, I knew the spirit problem would intrigue you. When an evil is irreparable, you know it is the best consolation to turn the mind to any other subject. He'll do it, Adam. I told you he would. Oh, this is so, 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 why? I must be worse. The Lord be praised. I think even between those lines, we can see that what Richard Leisure and Anna and Mariah were, in, were, were involved in, and the work that Linda Society did, and the, the letters particularly National Library Island, how they had time and energy to do what they did. It's amazing. We're very near there. I'm keeping up to Mr. Bellis' instructions. Example, which is smooth. Oh, we filmed this as well. I hope Mrs. Bellis doesn't get to see this film, and she's had 30 years of it. We're out of but on film as well, we'll that finish her off. It's awesome. Um, yes, I have got, a, so you probably have loads of descriptions of Ocean's Town House. I mean, what, I mean, what wallpaper went where and all the alterations, the alterations of these pillars. Um, I have got, and I've cut it to keep Mrs. Bellows happy, of uh, descriptions of here where I just sat there and descriptions of this and the pillars and what have you. Uh, particularly by Anna, which I can, which I can leave you. Um, but I you can certainly put together a book about Ocean's Town and all the improvements and the decorations and the colours of this and the colours of that. And, Mr. Richard all those with like the feel of the red drapes and it goes on and on. I feel as I live there already. Um, later on, Nana is living in, in, in Bath. Um, Mariah Richard visited here, this house on the right. Um, we're near at the end. Books for Maria to her nieces and nephews. Because she was an educationalist and she was huge and she, and, 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 yeah, she was so popular, the money that she made, seven times more than um, Jane Austen. Um, but she's writing to Snaid, I keep writing to Snaid, to Snaid, dear Mr. Snaid, dear Snaid, sorry. I prefer prints to books as presents from me to my nieces and nephews. These are the nieces and nephews of Anna and Emily, who are, Emily, who are both in, in Bristol at Bath at the moment. Because I wish to avoid both in reality and in appearance, all interference in their education, and in this point of view, it appeared to me that prints must be unobjectionable and pleasing and useful both to parents and children. If either you think Anna and Emmeline would like better to have books than prints for their children, I beg you will consult them and get exactly the books they may desire, neither following your judgment nor mine, but the wishes and choices. I think that for me sums up Mariah, that she was, um, you know, she wasn't forcing her educational principles onto anybody. Um, oh. Uh, I think this is your fault here. I think things are wrong. I think your family are We only got to the big finish. Let me try again. Uh, Richard had left a visit to Clifton. My father was pleased and happy all the time he was there. Liked all his three grandchildren very much and finished by saying to M, an amicable animal, 
you may imagine how much pleasure this gave me. I put that one in because there was a theory that crystal vision fell out of the line. Um, I'm not sure that was altogether true. Right, Mr. Tute, I said that right, how do I pronounce your name? That's like, okay, okay. You could have a whole book about Edge of the Tooth, I think, in the National Library. Your family's all over the place. Anyway, here we go. We stayed, this is Mariah writing, we stayed till about three or four in the morning that the Pastillion had, had, it seems, amused himself at a club so much that he did not know the ditch from the road. He was ambitious of passing Mr. Deezer's carriage, passed it, attempted to pass Mr. Toots, failed, ran the wheels onto a drift of snow which overhung the ditch, and lay the coach fairly down on its side. We were none of us hurt. Uh, the us were Mr. E. Henry, the uh, packing them up would be myself, Mrs. Edgeworth felt undermost. I never felt at all, for I clung like a bat to the hamstrings of my side, determined that I would not fall upon my mother and break her arm. The gentleman hauled us out immediately. Admiral P lifted me up from the dirt and carried me in his arms as if I had been a little doll, set me down actually on the step of Mr. Duke's carriage, and I never wet foot or shoe. And now, my dear aunt, I have established a character for courage in own terms for the rest of my life. Go for it, Bernard. You know, let, let's make a bit positive about life. And I think she was, wasn't she? Um, Maria's reputation in Italy, um, 1823, Anna dies in 1824. Um, I think Maria, uh, Anna's dead trough to this one. Two or three days ago, an English lady's house, and I was I made very much of by a fashionable lady in the room who introduced her two particular boys to me. They opened their young eyes in doubt and astonishment upon the sister of the lady who has written those beautiful stories, Rosalind, Frank, etc. When I told them what a merry little creature you were and that I was thought a little like you, they seemed better pleased and smiled upon me and graciously. Four of Mrs. Wilbraham's children stood round me and I had a very pleasant conflict with the little group. So you see that your influence from the little frightful bobby obscure county of Longford reaches even to the banks of the Arno. Very popular. My college was all over, all over Europe and America. Mariah Rachel and Helen, I'm coming to the end, you'll see where the connections are here. I, um, we can't, I can't help but keep making the parallel to Jane Austen. And this could be straight out of Jane Austen, or it's not, it's out of Helen. Um, I think, where she's writing, women are now so highly cultivated and political subjects are at present of much importance, of such high interest to all human creatures who live together in society. You can hardly expect, Helen, that you as a rational being can go through the world as it is now without forming any opinion on points of public importance. You cannot, I conceive, Satisfy yourself with a common namby pamby little missy phrase, ladies have nothing to do with politics. Go on, sister, great. Um, I, 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 I believe that, that this, this was more I speak, not Could be wrong. It's just a point of view, all of you. Um, we've come into the end now, the last three words to the three sisters, Mariah, Emily, and Anna. And we're going to see a castle, and I'm not sure what we come to. Um, uh, uh, castle Hack in a minute. I, I think this is to do with the, the senior edgeless castles and land. But Emily's writing the poems around. To noble castles, land, and wealth, your ancestry had claim. You to your native land bequeath, Edgeworth, your brilliant fame. And Mariah's not one for you know, accepting praise. Graciously, and she replies, I'm impressed with what I thought the shady. Here we go. I wish I had the castle's back. I wish I were a castle hack. I am a mean and sordid elf. Far more than fame, I value self. I want, I'm not quite sure what this castle hack is, I mean, somebody might want to fill me in on that one. Right, last five, you were pleased to know. Oh, I'm three minutes over. Sorry, Mrs. Bellows. Um, Anna to Mariah. Um, I hope you will not think I have told those things which I ought not to have told, or left untold those things which I ought to have told, for I do not wish to be the cause of one of your tight-laced faces. <laughs> Thank you.
the, the slide you showed there, we'd be following that same route on Sunday to Tullinani Castle. That was when they were returning home from a late night party in Tullinani Castle. And uh, I think the carriage driver went to the Pollard Inn and got well, <laughs> <laughs> well inebriated and, and uh, racing each other home with the, over the ditch. Uh, you also mentioned Sir Humphrey Davy, and uh, Humphrey Davy visited Edwards Town on numerous occasions. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Sharkey there, Bertie, would be very interested in Dr. Beddoes and his, and his, uh, his inventions or his discoveries. Um, so, we now uh, move on and uh, we have a bit of music again from Joseph and then uh, the following, uh, the final event of the evening then is John McGarry will just uh, give us an introduction to the membership of the associate membership of the society.
my name is John McGarr and I've been, um, I'm responsible or have a role to play in playing our web presence for the Edgar Society. Uh, we have a web page, edgar.net, two Facebook pages, a Google Plus page and a Twitter feed. So there's quite a lot of information available there for anyone that's interested. Um, I created a website about the Edgar, the first website I ever did was back in 1999. Um, and it's actually still on the go. I can't edit it anymore, but um, it's been on the go since then. And I made a few contacts over the years. Um, I think actually Bernard Cannon, the first time I was talking, was through that website. Um, I was also involved with the creation of two history books with the local uh, historical society in 2003 2007. Uh, Edgertown, or Chap was published in 2003, which uh, sold very well and is currently out print. And Edgertown Myths and Memories, which you can still buy if you're interested. Uh, I also, for along with Matt, we created a for the gathering in 2013 an interactive computer program um, that uh, displayed the history of the town in video, photos, and words. Now, of course, with the rise of the internet, that's kind of obsolete technology, but it was uh, pretty good at the time. Uh, Matt and I also came up with the idea of the historical panels that you can see in the middle of the town, which depict the history in a series of panels, some of the key members of, uh, that have played a role in Edgetown history over the years. And. Uh, Tonight we're officially launching our Edward Associate membership of the Edward Society. It's a 10 euro annual subscription. You can go online to the Edward site and uh, click on a link there and it will bring you to a page where you can register uh, via PayPal. Um, at the moment, all you'll get for your 10 euros is uh, the privilege of joining us plus a newsletter. The first uh, newsletter is there, uh, the cover of Matt's. Uh, Heritage Hero Award earlier in the year and uh, we hope to offer more things in the future and um, we hope people will sign up. Thank you very much.
present of much importance, of such high interest to all human creatures who live together in society. You can hardly expect, Helen, that you as a rational being can go through the world as it is now without forming any opinion on points of public importance. You cannot, I conceive, satisfy yourself with a common namby-pamby little missy phrase, ladies have nothing to do with politics. Go on, sister, great. Um, I, 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 I believe that, that this, this was more honestly. Um, we're coming to the end now, and in the last three words to the three sisters, Mariah, Emily, and Anna. And we're going to see a castle, and I'm not sure what we come to. Um, uh, uh, castle Hack in a minute. I, I think this is to do with the, the senior edges, castles and land. But Emily's writing the poems, Mariah. To noble castles, land, and wealth, your ancestry had claim. You to your native land bequeath Edgeworth your brilliant fame. And Mariah's not one for you know, accepting praise graciously. And she replies, I'm impressed with what I thought the night shady. Here we go. I wish I had the castles back. I wish I were a castle hack. I am a mean and sordid elf. Far more than fame, I value self. I want, I'm not much what this castle hack is. I mean, somebody might want to fill me in on that. Right, last slide, you were pleased to know. Oh, I'm three minutes over. Sorry, Mrs. Fellows. Um, Anna to Mariah. Um, I hope you'll not think I have told those things which I ought not to have told, or left untold those things which I ought to have told. For I do not wish to be the cause of one of your tight-laced faces. Thank you.